So what a great day. Good to see you all. Uh, man, I've been hurting like crazy. My back's been stupid. If you if you know me, uh, you know I've been hobbling around for like the last month or so, maybe longer. And uh, finally, 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 I went to a chiropractor. I even dropped his name because he did such a good job. Dr. Sam Sixmeyer. Who knows Dr. Sam? A couple dudes. There you go, Molly. Well, anyway, I went to go see Dr. Sam. And uh, he goes through the thing. Now, honestly, sometimes chiropractors, I don't, I'm like, ah, do you really work? Are you a witch doctor? What are you? And uh, so Dr. Sam, first of all, he takes like seven x-rays, which is unusual for a chiropractor, right? And then he does all these other tests. And then he sits me down and he says, Trev, you're out of balance. I'm like, okay, I can believe that. But he took the pictures of the x-rays and he showed me. Look how high this side is. Look how low that side is. Look at this and this. I mean, he, he went through these x-rays and showed me where I was actually out of balance. Then the guy started working on me, and I was pretty skeptical. And then one of my little hot spots on my back, I'm like, I'm not even going to tell him. If he's worth the salt, he'll know where it's at. And I mean, within 10 seconds, that guy says, oh, my, you have a rib out right here. He found it. I'm like, okay, well. Uh, so he fixed that and kind of worked me around. And um, about a week ago, I was helping a friend uh, learn how to deadlift. And I tried to pick up about 300 pounds. And, I mean, it went badly. Just to show him how to get lined up and do it. So the rest of that Friday, I hardly walked. It shook when I came up. Everything is out of balance. It just whoop, 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 shook. You could just feel things badly. And he even told me, he said, if you try to pick something up, you're going to shake because you're so out of balance here. Other things are trying to do the job. You can't do it that way. So when he fixed me up, I was with Jim Rats, Wes, and the gang yesterday. And uh, they had about 300 on the bar. I got in there, picked it up three times like it was nothing, like there was no weight on the bar. Because why? I'm in balance now. It's amazing. I thought, how incredible that is. Yeah, I was happy. Um, I stopped. I didn't push it up. Wes is going to add weight. I'm like, no, no, we'll just stop right there. Uh, I'm, let me celebrate this one. Uh, I say all that to say this. This morning, some of you were out of balance. And as you experience the loads in life, you're shaking everywhere. And things aren't working as they should because spiritually, you're off balance. Uh, only in, in Jesus do we get balance. Only when we line up with him... Does balance come to your life? I'm not going to give you ten principles on how to have a balanced spiritual life. I'm going to give you one. Find Jesus and line up with him. Okay, let's close in prayer. <laughs> you can go home now. Uh, find Jesus and you line up with him. Uh, so many times we try to get him to line up with us. We try to get our theology, everything to like bless the thing we think we're supposed to be doing. But in reality, we need to find where Jesus is and just line up with the king. Line up with Jesus. Now, um, one of the tougher things about lining up with Jesus is um, his body. I can line up with the head. Sometimes it's the body I have trouble lining up with. Look around, right, left. We are the body of Christ. If you're here this morning, you're part of the body of Christ. So... It's easy to line up with Jesus. Sometimes it's harder to line up with me. Uh, because you're like, well, Trev, sometimes you're not so easy to line up with. Now, we're going to go to something in this passage. If you're single here, there's a lot in here for you. Uh, this is a chunk of scripture oftentimes used for marriage counseling. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 33. And he starts off with wanting us to line up with the part of the body that deals with your spouse. Now, at any given time, uh, the very first verse says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it doesn't stop with just a marriage relationship. Because how many know when the Bible was written, it wasn't written in chapters and verses. It goes right into chapter 6, and it talks about employers or slaves and masters. Uh, children, parents. So it goes into other relationships. So these principles, uh, what we're going these spiritual truths about lining up relationally, they work anywhere. Not just husbands and wives, but you can't get away from it because there's 
a powerful picture inside of marriage that we have to talk about today. So, here we go. You ready? Some of you guys are already fighting with your spouse. You're like, oh, no. So, verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to state the obvious. Submit to one another. Uh, this was not a one-way street. When I got married, my pastor, God bless him, made Cindy say she would obey me three times. And I think he did that because she laughed the first time. Uh, but it's not just having a wife submit to a husband or obey a husband. In fact, it's there's a submission one to another. And it says, uh, the word submit, though, uh, submit is I'm going to get this wrong. So if you know Greek, forgive me. Hapatesto. That's right for crossings, right? Yay, I said it right. Hapatesto, which means to take strength and put it under something else. To take one's power and put it under. To submit means I would take my power, my strength, and I inject that under someone else. So it's not just like I'm powering in submission. It's like I've taken my skill set, I've taken who I am, I've taken my abilities, and I've said, here, I'm going to use this under you. When I submit to Jesus, how much is, how much of your life is under Christ? It should be all. Okay, let's, let's do this again. We're going to answer to this. When you submit it to Jesus, how much of your life is under him? All right, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. Uh, we don't just say to Jesus, Jesus, you got 90% of the best of me. I mean, no, that's not lordship. That, that faith doesn't save you. It's like even if you're an absolute wreck and everything in your life is broken and messed up, that person's okay if they say, Lord, here, you get all of me. The, the bad, the good, the ugly, everything. Here, Jesus, I just hand it to you. I'm under your submission. And when it says submit to one another, hapateso, take your strength, put it under someone else, to one another. That means in marriage, when a couple gets married, let's use Cindy and me. Cindy took her ability, she took her gifting, she took her intellect. How many here know Cindy's smarter than I am? <laughs> you should have had both hands up. Cindy's faster than I am. Like, play cards with Cindy. She, I'd be wearing a barrel if we gambled all the time. She's just smarter, fat, all these things. So she took all her strength and abilities, and she brought them to the marriage, and she hapateso, they, she submitted them under my authority. But guess what else happens? We submit one to another. I, too, all the abilities I have, Passion, strengths. I took those and I said, you know what? I'm I'm submitting in here in this relationship under an authority. Meaning, all the strength that I have, I'm using to build up towards Cindy. I don't say, Cindy, you got 90% of me, babe. How many know that's not okay? How many know we got names for guys that say, hey, but 10% of me likes to run wild? No, doesn't work. All, all in. Cindy's all in. We're submitted one to another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the NIV here, when it says reverence, eh, I like the word fear better. <laughs> I'll tell you why. The Greek word for fear here is phobos. Sound a little bit like phobia? It literally means Alarm, fright, be afraid, exceedingly fearful, terror. It, it says nothing like, I fear you, Lord, and just respect. It says, when it says, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ, it says, no, out of fear for Christ. Why is this so, why is this word used? And in fact, if you go through Greek antiquity, Homer uh, Plato, they all use it this way. It's not used soft almost ever. Why is it stated so heavily? I have one reason why. Jesus came on this earth and took all his strength. 
all his power, all his authority. And he submitted it to the will of the Father. And more than that, he submitted it at a cross. And he took everything he had to rescue you and me. So when we say, oh no, I'm the man in this relationship, or I'm the better partner in this relationship, so therefore I should rule with an iron fist. Um, no, because we have Jesus the King himself that became nothing for us. Now, he's not nothing now. And that's why it says, out of fear for Christ. Why? Because how many know if if I'm pulling rank on Cindy, Jesus is saying, wait a second. I gave myself for you. I humbled myself to death for you. I palpitated for you. And you're saying that you're too good or you're too powerful or you're too smart. No, it doesn't play. It doesn't play. So, that first verse is a doozy, is it not? Then we get into the wives part of this whole deal. So, buckle up, ladies. This is tough because in our culture we've tried to divide, we've tried to erase roles. Uh, I don't. I won't get deep into this because it's, it's so plainly obvious we don't need to. Uh, but there is a difference between men and women. Everybody in the house said amen. To erase that is to erase our God-given dignity. If you're a man here today, be a man. God made you that way. You were knit together. We're not all the same as men. Some men are creative. Some men are, uh, you know, engineers. Some men are not. Some men, you know, we're all created different, every one of us, male or female. However, there's a distinct difference between male and female, both in how God made you, and, and what our roles are in this big plan God has for us. So it's hard for a lot of our culture to get this. Uh, in fact, this is hostile to a lot of our culture, what I'm about to read. But we're at crossing this morning, so let's go. We're just reading the Bible as it is. It says, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. So my pastor all those 35 years ago was actually right. Cindy, submit. Um, I used to have a friend that said, would say, I have two words for you. He was talking to his wife. He says, submit. <laughs> and the troubling thing is, uh, sometimes uh, the husband's not the best leader. He's not the smartest guy. He's not better. But yet the word of God says, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, I've had ladies like put qualifiers on. I'll submit to him when he's, and she gives like this qualifier. Like when he's super godly. You know, he's a Christian now, but he's got to be more godly than me. Then I'll submit. Or he's got to, you know, be better romantically. Or he's got to be more intellectual or whatever. Uh, the Bible doesn't say any of that. It says submit to your husbands. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter jumps in. He weighs in on this topic. It's not on the screen, so you have to write it down and look it up later. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 2 says, Wives, in the same way, submit to yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, meaning they're not even believers, they may be won over without words, by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So what's Peter's advice? You've got someone that obviously is not a believer, may not be what we would say, well, I'm going to go submit to that guy. Peter says, no, submit to them. Your lifestyle, your godliness, your purity will lead them to the Lord. So, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Is Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. So there is an order in a household. Men, you're the head of the household. Uh, this is a spiritual mystery. This is how God set it up. It works when it happens this way. Uh, guys, you may say, well, I don't want to lead. Sorry. Guys, you have to step up. You have to lead. You are the head of the household, Scripture says. Um, that is... Terrifying in our culture today. 
But this is what the word says. Just as Christ is the head of the church, how many agree Jesus is the head of the church? How many say Jesus is probably a better head of the church than you are of your household? I would say that of mine as well. Does that take me or you off the hook? Absolutely not. There's this temptation, guys, to just run from responsibility. My challenge to you today is run to it. This will be a blessing for your wife. This will be a blessing for your kids. This will be a blessing for you. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. He reinforces this idea. Um, now, of course, if your husband's asking you to sin, you know, I think there's an obligation. Like, no, no, we're not going to do that. Ask you to harm yourself? Nah, we're not going to do that. But there are times where you're going to submit to things your husband wants. Cindy and I have a rule. Here's our rule. There's issues that come to the table. Like any good team on the planet, we throw that issue on the table and we discuss it. And we bring out the options and we bring up the solutions and we talk about what's best. And, and most of the time in that setting, we figure out a solution together and we move forward. Uh, there have been so many times as a couple where Cindy has had the better angle on an issue. And I've said, oh, good catch, good catch. Let's go there. And we move together as a team. But what are we doing together in that prayer? Well, we're submitting one to another. Her strength, my strength. Uh, her wisdom, my wisdom. Now, every now and again, um, we'll be like, we're at an impasse. Uh, guess what hat I wear? I'm like, okay, Cindy. I'm prayerfully leading. And she said, Trev, God's going to judge you. I'm following. Good luck. <laughs> and I, I said, okay, let's let's go here. Let's go this direction. Uh, how many know that I believe God blesses Cindy so big time in that? Because when she does that, it's not unto Trev. It's as unto Jesus. And how many know Jesus will help Trev and Cindy when we're playing our roles and we're honoring God in this direction. So, um, he says, um, verse 26, to make her holy, Jesus gave himself up. Oh, wait a second. I jumped. Here we go. Verse 25. Let's, let's go to verse 20. There's the lady's responsibility. Verse 25. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Guys, there's a mouthful. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ Loved the church and did what? Gave himself up for her sacrificial love. Submitting is way easier than sacrificing. Um, guys, we are called to love as Jesus loved the church. Now, she's submitting to us as the church submits to Christ, but we're sacrificing like Jesus did for the church. That's a love that's unselfish. See, we talk about the joy of like, oh, I'm the head of the house. No, that means you're first to die. That means you're the first to go without. That means you're the first to sacrifice. How many have ever submitted to someone uh, in, in a sacrificial way? Because that's what we're doing. Husband and wife, wife to husband. Okay, I have a, an example. Right now, my beautiful little grandson, we... We have watched this weekend. He spent the night at our house last night. Jameson Parsons was is at my house. Cindy's not here because she doesn't know what to do. She's like, oh, I can't even shower. So that's probably why she's not here. That little guy has taken two of us. We forgot how we even raised children. We have no idea how Lindsay and Lauren survived the ordeal because we don't know. Don't tell Lauren this. If she's six hours late, we're going to die. As soon as I get done here, I'm running home like Cindy. Let me just hold Cindy and cry. And, because it's constant. 
Oh, we got to change the diaper. Oh, he's going to do this. Oh, he needs to burp. Oh, he just threw up. Oh, and guess what? This little dude is 11 months old, and he's got two 55-year-olds in complete submission. All of our power, all of our time, all of our everything is dedicated to this little guy that we would die for. And I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. It's the best thing ever. You haven't lived till you've lived selflessly. You haven't found the way of Christ till you've lived sacrificially. Guys, if if uh, if we would sacrifice more in our households, we would get a better result. I once had a marriage end in counseling with me. Now, if I'm going to marry you, don't get scared. <laughs> it's an easy go, but I will tell you this: because I, what's my one rule? Line up with Jesus. Just get that right. Things go well. However, in this one, we're talking about issues, and I have this test I do with couples. If you've been with me, you know this question. Name three things you wish your partner would do more often. Well, they they thought of some hypotheticals. They had this discussion, and, and the guy says, when we get married and we move into our house, I demand the master closet. I almost fell out of my chair. Oh, uh, you what? You may want the master closet. No, he says, no, I, I have to have the master closet in this house. Says, Ooh, hold on. Let's talk about this. Next thing you know, there was a whole list of stuff this guy wanted first. A whole list. And I looked at that young lady, and I said this. Run. You guys should not get married. You should walk out of this place, break it. And, and they did, thank God. Why? That guy wasn't willing to sacrifice even a master closet. Guys, in our culture, we have to be guys. Cindy used to say, Trev, I admire that you can take a punch. Now, we grew up in Granite City, like Caitlin, so watch it. She'll hit you right now. (laughs) We grew up in a rougher area where fists would fly, like conversations often ended with knots on your head. And, uh, Man, Cindy and I get an argument when we were younger. There was spousal abuse. Like, I, I hear people say, oh, we got to go check them. No, no, I got beat. <laughs> because when we came from, man, getting slugged was just a thing. And Cindy and I, Trev, I just scream, bam, ow, hey. And it was just how we communicated. Well, that's how she communicated. <laughs> but I didn't mind it, really, because I'm a big dude, and she's just feisty, and just how it was, right? And um, she hit me today, but she, it hurts her hands. But <laughs> but she'd only say, Trev, I'm just glad you're a guy that can take a punch. Now, I thought about that when I was younger. I'm like, I want to quit taking that punch. Now, she didn't beat me, guys. I, I don't want you to think she's abusive, because she's probably watching this right now. Sorry, Cindy. But what I am saying is this. She admired the fact that I could take a punch and that in our relationship, I've taken a couple for her. Different concept. I think, guys, when it says Jesus gave herself, when it says Jesus gave himself up for the church, man, he took a punch. Way more than a punch. Guys, we got to start learning how to take stuff again. Uh, the culture would have you just be little daisy cups, like soft, I melt, and spoil anything, I'm going to cry in my box of tissues all the time. Not that men don't cry, but dudes, let's learn how to be the guy in the relationship again and take a punch. Learn to sacrifice. It's okay to sacrifice. It's okay to take one for the team. Uh, I think, guys, when it says that Jesus uh, cleansed her by the washing with water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle and any other blemish but holy and blameless. What's Jesus doing with us right now as we sit here looking at the word? He's purifying. He's shaping us. He's making us better than we are. Why? So when we get married, the bride is like, oh, man, that bride's pretty. Dressed up, ready to go. Guys, we have to get back to that place where we're adding value to our wives. I think, guys, you're the first watchman of your household. 
You should be the one that stops ugly stuff from coming in. It shouldn't be your wife saying, oh, oh, honey, should we be doing that? Should we watch this? Should we bring that? No, guys, it should be us. It should be us that ha- that is the first to raise the standards, first to bring righteousness, first to bring what's good, first to keep out what's bad. That's what Jesus does. We should be one that invests actively in our families. Jesus has invested. He washes. He he cares for. He adds value. Guys, think of how you can add value. So as a, as a man, it's not just I'm in charge. No, I'm sacrificially in charge. I'm watching for the purity of this marriage and this household. I'm looking out. How can I invest? Have you thought about that? Like, what what are what has God put in my wife to do? And am I giving things to help her become what God's called her to be? Or am I standing in the way of it? This is a big bill for us guys. In the same way, verse 28, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body. But they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Uh, I love this example because, guys, how many going to eat lunch today? What? what? Uh, how many get hangry? Like Cindy tells this story. She says, the maddest I ever saw Trev. We were just married. And God bless her. She made my lunch. And if you know Cindy, she's not Holly Homemaker. That's not my wife's gig. But we were just married, and she's like, I'm going to make Trev lunch, take to work. And so she made me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And, and I was so excited about those peanut butter, butter and jelly sandwiches. And I, I get there, and she literally took jelly. I mean, it had to be a drop. And just spread it all over the bread to where it was colored bread. There was no jelly on there at all. Same thing with the peanut butter. It was just brown. There was no peanut butter. It was like discolored bread together. And I, I was with the boys at work, and I pulled out the sandwich, and I'm, I'm looking at them like, there's nothing. There's nothing on my – I was mad. I'm not even kidding. I came home. I stopped up these stairs of this apartment we were living, and I said, why would you do this to me? And was like, I, I care for this body. <laughs> I feed this thing. And the example given here is like, guys, let's be practical. We know how to take care of things. If I were to walk out here and scratch your car right now, just, hey, I'm going to leave before you guys. Uh, what are you driving today, Scott? I'm going to go scratch that thing. And I just went out and scratched your car. How many would be upset? Oh, yeah, there would be words spoken. Why? Because you're caring for your stuff. It's your stuff. Don't go messing with my stuff. I'm a guy. I keep it nice and clean and painted and all that stuff. How much more so are wives? Right? How much more so where they are in their spirit, where they are in their thinking, where they are physically, how much more? If we'll get upset about the paint on a car or what we're eating for lunch, the example is this. How much more your wife, if you care for your body like, if you care for your wife like you do your body, you'll be in good shape. Verse 30, for we are all members of his body. So, I think this. I think this. So many times, guys, do you realize that uh, this is God's girl you're you're living with. This is God's girl you're a partner with. This isn't just anybody. We're members of the same body. It says, uh, verse thirty-one. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, the two becoming one flesh is uh, starts in Genesis. This, this is quoted in the book of Genesis. Uh, there is something profound about a husband and wife coming together. Uh, do you, what a team. You and your wife together in Christ, submitted to one another, is powerful in prayer. If the Bible says, says if two or more agree touching anything, pray, it will be done. How much more a husband and wife? I'd rather have my wife praying with me on something than anybody else on the planet. Why? Because I know that girl prays. 
keep you cheered. It's going to be the real deal all day long. And we're one. We're one flesh. We're, we're a team. Now, this is why the Bible says that we should keep the marriage bed undefiled. Uh, I talked about purity last week and pornography and, and sexual immorality in our world. Guys, this is one reason to stay pure is because you don't want to defile the two of you. Uh, there's some other mysteries in here. Uh, I could talk about when Paul talks about uh, those who unite themselves with a prostitute becomes one with them in flesh. Um, how many have ever seen the illustration? Forgive the connect card abuse. So, let's say this is me or you. Let's say this is you. I'm tired of talking about me. Say this is you. And you connect with your wife. And you're together, and there's consummation, meaning there's a sexual relationship. There's the two become one. We trade parts, right? So uh, Cindy's got part of me. I got part of her. We're, we're one now. And, and Paul says something interesting. He says, um, he just it's just a quick statement, but he talks about those who unite themselves with a prostitute become one within the flesh. Let's say I step out and I have another uh, sexual relationship. And I start giving half of myself away at every turn. I mean, you guys ever seen the illustration? And I just keep going down this pit. Well, it gets it's easier to give this away than the whole thing away. And I end up with a little less of me every time I go down this pathway. And before now, before long, there's really not much to give away. And we wonder why we live in a culture that trades for so little stuff that will trade sex for nothing, that will get themselves in the worst situation. It's because we've played this game thinking that sex doesn't have real spiritual consequences, but it does. And this is why it's becoming so meaningless in our culture. Get to the point you can't hardly see it or care. There's hardly nothing here. And before long, we're diminished. Now, the beautiful thing in Christ, he does restore us. He makes us whole. Only Jesus can make us whole. But outside of him, guys, I'm going to tell you, we have a culture that's become less than nothing. And that's why we've cheapened ourselves. So that's why the Bible, on so many issues, when the Old Testament passed away, uh, the ceremonial eating, the ceremonial washing, all that stuff was part of the law. It, it took a back seat. The one thing that kept its prominence was the avoidance of sexual immorality. Why? Because there's an intimacy there. We're one in Christ. There's uh, literally the term is to conjugate. We're, we're one with Jesus. We're his bride. And as married couples where sex is blessed and ordained, you're, you're that picture of Christ in the church. You're one. And to cheapen that is to cheapen the whole deal. And let me tell you, because it's been cheapened, because people are avoiding marriage and people are avoiding purity inside of marriage, uh, the culture's been diminished to almost nothing. There's nothing to give away anymore. And that's why it's so important that if you're a married couple here today, you recognize the picture you are. You are the picture of Jesus and his church. And it's worth protecting. It's worth honoring. It's worth living. And when you live that picture out right, we'll have young ladies that have almost nothing left of themselves that can be restored and made whole in Jesus and be his beautiful bride. And guys, I think it's worth doing. I think it's worth doing because the world needs to be renewed. And it's only in Jesus. So it says, he's not talking about us, this mystery. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery. But I'm not talking about Christ, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. What's he saying? He's like, guys, this whole thing, you together, is a picture screaming of Jesus and his church and the hope he gives. Verse 33, however, each of you must, however, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Um, the Egelriches did a book years ago, some of you probably did it, called Love and Respect, based on this passage of scripture. And the premise is this, you've got two people that aren't evil, they may not get along, they're not perfect, 
perfect, but they're not evil. So you make this assumption that you, you submit to Christ and you submit your goodness, your strength to one another to build each other up. And then the husband thrives on respect. Think about it, guys. Um, uh, the quickest way for Cindy to really upset me is show me disrespect. Oh, oh, how many guys are with me there? Skip the hug, but show me disrespect. Like, if you skip hugging me, I'm like, ah, get over it. You show me disrespect, or, you know, what if, in whatever arena in my life, I'm just like, oh, it hurts. Quickest way for me to dishonor Cindy is not give that hug, not demonstrate love, not. That's the premise, and I think it's a pretty good one. And that we look at, look out for each other, that we give love and respect inside the marriage. We submit one to another. I heard this said, and I, I stole in it as my own. In fact, I can't hardly remember who said it first, so it's mine now. <laughs> I'm honest about that. That's terrible. Uh, but in every marriage, I say this to the couple in counseling or and or the marriage itself, and it's simply this. Marriage is simply this. It's a race to see who can give, them, give themselves away the quickest. It's a race to see who can give themselves away the quickest. Guys, if we live that way and we said, uh, my goal is to bless my wife, I want to honor her, I want to love I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, just guys, let's take that off the table. But in Christ, we're going to love and respect and honor. And w- ladies, if you did the same thing, how can I build him up? How can I use my strength to honor and, and make him everything God's called him to be? If, we, if that were a race every morning, how many of you know divorce rates would plummet? How many you know marriage rates would rise? So, like I said, in ourselves, we end up with a little chunk. In Christ, we end up with the whole deal. I recognize, because I live this world too, I've not been perfect in this. I, I don't want to say that I've been you know, always sacrificing. Sometimes I'm selfish. Sometimes I want what I want. And... God, forgive me for that. Let me live like you do. If you found yourself at loss, some of us here have been divorced, some of us here have lost great relationships, some of us here have been torn apart, like you feel like, ah, there's not much left of me. Can I encourage you, Jesus restores. Jesus brings life. Jesus brings hope. And you, the goal is for you to walk out here today, not condemned, not with a list of, oh, I did bad, but walk out of here today like, I am free and forgiven in Jesus, and he has restored me. He's made me a new creation in Christ, and I am whole in him. I am whole. No matter how much has been taken, I am whole in Jesus this morning. Let me say that's worth doing. That's so worthwhile. So we're going to pray. And some of you, as we went through this passage, you were like, you were like, wow, that's tough. That's really rough. I'm not doing so well. But here we are. You are. Because Christ has given all. He restores. He heals. He makes complete. So if that's you here this morning, I want you to, uh, well, this sounds very charismatic of me. I want you to ready yourself for what God would do with you as he restores your life. As he renews your life. And some of you guys, just like the valley of dead bones, man, you need a resurrection. You need a new you. And let God do that in you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that's in your son. And Lord, would you breathe new life right now, Lord, as we put our faith in you. The author, perfecter of our faith. Lord, would you bring life. Even as I pray this simple prayer, God, I pray there would be wholeness created right now. And that there would be freedom. That there would be a a twitch that's flipped that can never be flipped again. That they're continually flipped on in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, before you leave, we have communion today. How many uh, receive these? If you want to receive communion with us, you don't have to be part of Crossland's Church. You just got to love Jesus. You don't have to be perfect. You just need to love Jesus. Uh, if you if you need communion element, just raise your hand. Uh, these guys don't bite. They're just going to hand some out to you. Um, now, here's why I think this is super, super cool this morning. 
Jesus didn't give part of himself. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed us white as snow. Jesus gave it all. He held nothing, nothing, nothing back. That's that hapateso. He took his strength and he submitted it for our sake. Thank God for Jesus. Will you stand with me? Uh, if you have your elements, I want you to take the bread. We're encouraged to do this, to remember this, to recalibrate. You're not going to heaven because you're a great person. None of you are. How many are glad for that? You're going to heaven because God loved you and he demonstrated by sending Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and mine. Period. End of story. Jesus gave it all. He was broken for you and for me. And we remember that right now. Let's receive the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. Take the cup. And the cup represents his shed blood. And it's not just that we're forgiven here. This blood represents a covenant. God doesn't break covenants. And as we put our faith in Jesus, he has your life. You're a new creation. You belong to him. That old stuff that happened, that's gone. God doesn't remember it, nor should we. You're new in Christ. There's hope, there's freedom, there's life. How many say amen? Let's receive the cup together. Hallelujah. Thank you for life, Jesus. We love you and we thank you, God. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, we thank you for your life. We thank you, God, for who you are. Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory today. All God's people said, amen. Hey, go with Jesus. Stay cool and uh, love on each other. God bless.